exposed phase of the operation. Only 208 men were lost. The problem of how to cut through the sandbanks was solved by an ingenious Egyptian lieutenant who had worked on the construction of the Aswan Dam. British irrigation pumps powered high-pressure hoses which simply washed the sand into the canal. Using this technique, they cut the holes in half the time it would have taken with either explosives or bulldozers. And during the first day, they cut 60 of them. Cutting the gaps was a feat of Egyptian ingenuity, but bridging the canal was achieved through well-tried Soviet expertise and equipment. PMP bridges designed to cross European rivers were put into use for the first time under wartime conditions. The sectional pontoons could be joined to others in minutes. On the day, the Israeli garrison said they grew across the river like outstretched arms. Another Soviet crossing system was even quicker. The GSP ferry was formed by two amphibious lorries which linked together in the water and would then expand hydraulically, creating a platform that could carry a tank across the canal in a matter of minutes. Every aspect of the crossing operation had been thoroughly rehearsed and planned in minute detail by General Shazli's staff, with two goals in mind, surprise and speed. The whole Israeli defensive system in Sinai turned on the assumption that it would take 48 hours to get armoured divisions and heavy equipment across. They were convinced they could foil any attack in that time. In 10 hours, the Egyptians had already got 10 bridges set up and 500 tanks positioned on the east bank. Inside 24 hours, two infantry and two armoured divisions had crossed the canal. It was the high point of the war for Egypt. Within 30 minutes of the start of the war, the Israeli armoured reserve drove forward into the line according to plan, unaware of the reception that awaited them. They were decimated by the Egyptian tank hunting squads. Air power was inevitably Israel's next response flying into the teeth of the missile umbrella to stop the crossings, rather than concentrating on the missile sites first, as they'd known they should. Plans for a preemptive strike that morning had been ruled out by American pressure. Israel would get no support if it was seen as the aggressor, as Moshe Dayan had to explain to a bemused nation. In this case, the <laughs> Consider it, and it was the decision of the government not to strike first, even though we were sure that they will do that, in order to have that uh, political or whatever you call it advantage at the uh, expense of the uh, military uh, disadvantage. And that disadvantage was now becoming clearer as the Egyptians consolidated their hold on the East Bank. If they survived the missiles, the Air Force still had to locate the bridges hidden beneath smoke screens. Even when hit, their sectional construction made them easy to repair, and they could be floated to new crossing points with relative ease. Egyptian troops rejoiced in their achievement. They had destroyed the first counterattacks exactly according to plan, and now one by one, they were taking possession of the forts along the Barlev line. <laughs> Not all fell easily, though. The northernmost fort was never taken. And in the south, opposite Port Tufik, one officer and 42 men held out for a week before surrendering through the Red Cross. After repeated attacks, they were down to their last few grenades and bullets. The Egyptian officer who took over the fort believed they'd hidden their heavy weapons. The truth was, they had none. They were ferried across to Port Tufik, where the survivors helped their wounded comrades ashore and into captivity. Among the Israeli reserves pouring down the road into Sinai on Monday the 8th, morale was still high. Their confidence in another easy victory was reinforced by their route through the Mitla Pass, still strewn with the wreckage of Egyptian defeats in 1956 and 67.
but that mood was soon replaced by a much grimmer one as the reality of the situation and the extent of their early losses became apparent. In those first few days in Sinai, only the Egyptians had cause to celebrate. The Sinai front was 125 miles from the main Israeli cities, but in the north there was no margin for error. The Golan Heights were barely 17 miles across, and from this plateau littered with volcanic rock, four routes led down across the Jordan into northern Israel. The Benot Yaakov Bridge bore the most important, leading from Kenetra and the area HQ at Kafana Fak. A key Israeli observation point on Mount Hermon was known as the Eyes of Israel, as it overlooked the entire region. The Syrian plan was to cross the ceasefire line in one massive armoured assault, two columns forming a pincer to take Kafana Fak and the bridge, while others struck out for minor routes. At 1400, synchronised with the Egyptian attack, a 50-minute artillery barrage began. It paved the way for the Syrian armour, which then swept past the border posts. They flowed in like water, one Israeli said. I never knew there were so many tanks in all the world. The Israelis had 180 tanks and 60 guns with which to hold the 40-mile front. It was the most desperate and heroic struggle of the war. A young lieutenant with a handful of tanks held up the main Syrian thrust for 20 hours at one point. Ambushing, switching position, and attacking again. Mobile artillery proved effective in slowing the advance too, and it was well employed. For the sole Israeli advantage was in knowing the ground. They'd practiced over it numerous times, measuring the ranges and the best angles of fire. But they hadn't anticipated odds of 5 to 1, or at times 11 to 1 and remorselessly, they were forced back. As in Sinai, the Israeli Air Force was thrown in to slow the advance. But even at low level, running the gauntlet of the sand batteries proved costly. They lost 40 planes in the first afternoon. Infantry operated Sam 7s and anti-aircraft guns joined the white contails of the Sam 6s crisscrossing the sky to deadly effect. They adapted their tactics quickly though, flying in low over Jordan to take the Syrians in the flank, avoiding many of the batteries. Wrecked Syrian vehicles lining the route bore witness to their effectiveness. And in places, the burnt and blackened ground showed that like the Americans in Vietnam, they were using napalm. On Sunday, Israeli reserves in modified World War II Sherman tanks were deployed in the southern sector. They were opposing T-55s and even T-62s, the Russians' latest tank. Despite the 30-year technological gap, they destroyed greater numbers of Syrians. But at a cost. The two Israeli frontline brigades were virtually wiped out. They had, however, bought time for the citizen army. Mobilization had begun on Saturday. Many didn't wait for their code words. Seizing their equipment, they headed to either front, pressing lorries, cars and buses into service. One platoon even drove a milk float to their base in Sinai. Prime Minister Golda Meir expressed their mood. This people, small as it is, surrounded as it is by enemies, has decided to live. And if we have to pay the price for living, we have to pay it. This is not a people that can give in.